Hey there, this is Jacob from RoboFlow, here today to talk about the difference between unsupervised versus supervised learning in machine learning and AI. So let's dive in. Supervised learning is whenever labeled data are used to teach a machine learning algorithm to predict accurate labels within a constrained domain. So some example tasks might be image classification, where you're classifying images among a constrained set of categories, or object detections, where you're trying to recognize specific kinds of objects within an image. So let's take those apart and maybe talk about a couple of examples. Let's imagine we want to count the number of fish underneath the boat. We might need to put a camera underneath the boat and then provide example imagery to our algorithm of uh, the different fish that are in the image, where they're located, and draw a box around the fish and perhaps talk about what kind of species the fish are. Our algorithm will learn to model this label, uh, the, the labels that we are, are providing it, in this constrained setting. And this is where machine learning algorithms have really been shining um, in, the, in the fields of artificial intelligence and machine learning is when you have a constrained area where you can provide a ton of representative data so the algorithm can learn to map all the different possible inputs to outputs and, and achieves a very high level of accuracy. Sometimes even above human level where uh, you know something might be really repetitive like looking for missing screws on phones going down a conveyor belt. Now I also put in here some also known as phrases. So supervised learning is also known as an ML algo, or perhaps weak AI, or uh, sometimes you'll see the words many shot or few shot, meaning that many shots of data are shown to the algorithm or few shots of data are shown to the algorithm. And uh, lastly, semi-supervised, which is similar to few shot where a few examples are shown. And uh, in my mind, these all kind of fall under the same category of supervised learning. So now let's uh, dive into what unsupervised learning is. This is when unlabeled data are used to train general representations across web scale data sets. So these are, are usually kind of like the famous projects when you hear uh, a bunch of new papers coming out and uh, new landmark papers setting state of the art and things like that. There's usually a very large uh, compute intensive training job is done on a huge data set. And these don't require uh, labels in that uh, the labels can be auto generated by the algorithm that is training the uh, that is training the model. But the, the misleading fact here is that there are still labels that are um, providing you know, direction for the algorithm to be back propagating back through the network. That is something that I think is often misleading with unsupervised learning is the learning processes that are involved in training neural network, ner networks are still the same. So some famous papers uh, you might have heard of are uh, BERT, GPT-3, uh, SEER, wave to vec or data to vec and all, all of these are, are using approaches to learn across a huge corpus of data um, and they're um, either like masking a piece of the data like BERT masks a piece of the tasks or um, they're, they're doing some other clever tricks to uh, be able to train on this without having to, to label anything which is kind of where their, their real power shines because they can learn information from a huge uh, web scale corpus and uh, so the also known as here that I have is uh, self-supervised. Sometimes you'll see people say that, and I'm sure there are there are some academic uh, academics who would who would take me to the cleaners for putting these in the same category. But self-supervised is similar, where you have unlabeled data used to train general representations or general AI. Um, usually, people who are say they're working on general AI are kind of in this unsupervised realm of trying to think about what sort of representations can we uh, start getting more and more general from, or zero shot. Um, and that, that means that you can make predictions with these models uh, without having to provide any additional training data. You can just leverage the, the knowledge that the algorithm gleaned from its large, large paths through, through the web. Um, and that's really, really where the power of these models come from, is in the zero shot nature. So if you're not exactly sure what kind of thing you're gonna need to be predicting, or um, you know, uh, you may not have access to all the data that you're going to have. You can use uh, unsupervised learning models uh, to to kind of use this just off the shelf uh, model. Um, yeah, and so the other thing I wanted to talk about in this context is the notions of pre-training and fine tuning. So pre-training and fine tuning uses both unsupervised and supervised techniques. Uh, so general knowledge is gained from the unsupervised routine during pre-training. So for example, with BERT, there's a pre-training step where this is run over essentially like all of Wikipedia and all the words on the web, right? And then after that's done, you can take that same set of neural network weights and the representations that it's learned 
lift it off and then apply it to a new task. And this is where you fine tune into a specific data set. And that's what uh, fine tuning is. So fine tuning, uh, the pre-training, unsupervised. The fine tuning is supervised, pretty much always. And uh, you can kind of use these techniques uh, in, in, uh, in tandem. And you can also still fine tune off of a supervised method. So you can keep fine tuning, you can keep building models on checkpoints of models and, and you can continue down uh, that path of continuing to refine your technique with, with new data sets. Um, and so this is kind of a very useful notion to keep in mind. And, and sometimes you can get, you know, just like a little bit of a, a, a small boost um, just by having a better pre-training routine. Um, although I will say here um, that the magnitude that pre-training will benefit uh, your, your specific fine-tuned model is never anything uh, remotely close to what just having, you know, a better representative data set can, can do for you. Um, and so the next question that uh, a lot of people ask is, are unsupervised models taking over? You know, so you hear all these famous papers get released and it seems like we're all the cutting edge tech in, you know, Facebook AI research or OpenAI or, you know, DeepMind or some of these like big names that you'll hear in AI are working on. And so you kind of wonder, you know, is, is everything going into some sort of unsupervised setting? Um, and the answer is, is definitely not, um, in that when you start to take a look at real world problems uh, where there are constrained domains that people really need to apply machine learning technology to, uh, the supervised methods uh, still kind of continuously uh, outperform. And, and that's just because, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the set of uh, outputs that need to be mapped to inputs are usually better within some kind of constrained setting somewhere where there's a specific domain knowledge that may not have been present on the web even at all in the unsupervised uh, training routines. So here I have an example of uh, RoboFlow Universe data sets uh, that were benchmarked by the Microsoft Florence paper. Um, this was cool at RoboFlow to see that people were thinking a little bit like uh, we were in terms of thinking about taking these general models and bringing them into these specific situations. But you can see here, these are all object detection data sets where you're locating an object in an image. And you can see here that with the zero shot approach, this Lawrence model gets this kind of baseline approach, which is pretty impressive and is, is climbing up quite high. But whenever you fine tune a model fully that is fully trained it on the data set, it gets a much better performance. So these are blood cells here. Uh, these are chess pieces. Um, and you can see there, that's the difference between 13%. Uh, this is MAP too, by the way, which is some measure of how well the boxes are lining up. Um, so 13% versus 80%. You have here on pistols, 41% versus 74%. And that's just because, you know, the data set is going to have a specific view of the way things are. And as, as will you, as you're working on, you know, the use case that, that you have in mind. Um, so as a final slide here, I'd like to talk a little bit about the supervised uh, process, and this is also kind of the same process as fine tuning. So this involves uh, this, this process um, that we kind of have this virtuous cycle here of an idea that we have at RoboFlow, where you first collect uh, data. So you collect images, in, in, in our case, you organize them uh, into you know, sets, of, sets of data to um, be labeled. You label those images and you start to provide some supervision to the network by you know your own annotations or if you have uh, labelers working for you. Um, and then you use those labels in combination with the broad data to train a model. And then you train this model to be modeling the domain that you've, you've then collected. Then you deploy your model and you know, it's going live, it's actually in an application. And we like to think that then you start that whole process back over again because you find new edge cases, you find new little things, and then you update it. You kind of keep going around the circle and that's one thing that we've been uh, trying to make uh, very easy at RoboFlow is the you know, continuous circle of supervised learning techniques. And I hope you learned uh, quite a bit from this video. And uh, as always, like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. And we'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much.